Okay, we've been waiting on you. Come on in. Take that robe off. Sit down and relax. <laughs> yeah, you, here, grab a chair. <laughs> and uh, Bobby brought you black coffee, uh, so. That's terrific. Uh, yeah. Well, Sherry said, is he taller than you are? I said, yes, by an inch. So. Uh, but he's much better looking. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's my opening question. So when somebody invites you out to dinner, what's the one thing you don't want to be on the menu? Beets. <laughs> Beets, okay. I've learned to eat them because my grandmother had a rule that, that you had to try whatever she presented and you had to try it every time. So I have gradually built a, a good tolerance for it. There's nothing else, just beets? I'm a really good eater. So the word is no beets. No beets. <laughs> All right. Favorite ice cream? Tuna fudge ripple. It's just delicious. <laughs> I know. That's a, that's a... Everything I said about him, I take back. <laughs> huh. I, you know, I love pistachio. I love... Uh, Butter pecan, but I, I'm again. I'm one of those equal opportunity ice cream eaters. I love ice cream. <laughs> As, all right, favorite music group. Who's the who's the who's your top Pandora channel, or Spotify, or whatever those are? You know, I I quite like a band called Coldplay. It's become quite popular. Um, I'm I'm a fan of old Frank Sinatra. Um, yes, yeah, a lot can be said for him. Um, my Frank Sinatra once kissed my sister, story for another day. Um, I'm not sure he should have, but um, yeah, I love, um, I love Aretha Franklin, I love a wide range of eclectic, of, yeah, I have eclectic musical taste. I love classical music, so yeah. which one of your children do you like best? <laughs> I like the one, the one that just shook his fist. I, I like him most. Hey, and, Reed, and, would you and Cole and Carissa, Carissa stand up back there so we can welcome the three of you? Yeah. And, I, and the, one, the one next to him, I like him best. And the one that's not here, I like him deepest. <laughs> now, Reed is a postdoc student in organic chemistry. Cole at the coal, excuse me, at the University of Michigan, okay, and we told him he needs to ask about Ronnie Cresswell, and uh, and Reed, he's into all things IP, right? IT, yeah. IT, P, IT, what? Yeah, and and you're li okay. He's in Michigan. You're in Columbia, Missouri, Columbia, Missouri. and Carissa is starting med school next year. Yeah. So uh, I tell you, getting to know them has just been a delight. Sit down now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, all right. What in the world were you doing on an offshore oil rig? What? what? My, my dad had this uh, theory that uh, his kids would do better in life if they were exposed to the widest possible spread of experiences. And so he always encouraged us to do something different uh, every summer. And I was driving up to uh, New Haven to college, uh, and I picked up a hitchhiker. And this is in the days when you actually did that sort of thing and weren't afraid. And this fellow had just come from the oil fields of Oklahoma. And he told me that he would had this incredible experience. He'd made a huge amount of, of cash. And so I went home to my dad, and I said, Dad, do you know anybody in the oil business? And my father uh, had a client. My dad was a corporate litigator and had uh, a client and gave me his name, who, who was working with mobile. And whatever that name was, it was gold. And uh, because every firm that I wrote to, every drilling outfit I wrote to, when I dropped that name, they offered me a, jo a job. And I just, I picked the offshore one because it looked to me to be the most exotic. 
I had seen a Miller beer commercial. You know, it's Miller time, sunset on the oil rig. You know, it just, <laughs> it just looked good. And I figured that is about as out there for an Ivy League kid to go do as anything I can think of. And uh, so I wound up spending uh, the better part of, uh, I think, three months uh, out on a, on a rig. And it was a great experience. I learned about multiple intelligences there. I realized that I was actually the least valuable person on the rig. I had the most education. I was the least useful. And I, I, was, I learned a lot of respect for engineering gifts and all the practical know-how that goes with uh, operating. In so did industry. you ever work the chain on the drill stem and all that stuff? I was a, I was a roustabout at the beginning, which is a custodian. <laughs> uh, and then there was, I was field promoted when one of the, the, the roughnecks got injured. I was the biggest guy, so they made me a roughneck. And then I worked up around the hole, and I would catch the pipe and guide it down into the... Uh, into the end of the previous pipe. Uh, so I got a lot of great experience doing that. Yeah, amazing. The other one is a maximum security prison. Okay, explain that. Yeah, so I another one of those varied experiences that my dad was responsible for, I went to... Uh, <laughs> My father was philanthropically involved with an organization called the South 40 Corporation in New York City. And those of you with agriculture background know that South, South 40 is the term for that part of one's holdings that is undeveloped, but which you sit on your porch at night and think, you know, if I ever develop the South 40, what could come from that land? And, and this became, this was a Christian prison ministry that had a vision for the, uh, the inmates of the American correctional system as the, as the undeveloped potential. Hmm. And I, um, so I took a job there and worked in uh, a maximum security prison in Bedford, New York, where I remember at that time, Dr. Tarnower had been killed, the, the Scarsdale diet doc, you remember that story? And Jean, was it Jean Harris? She was there. Uh, and then I worked in a in another uh, facility in the in Harlem, uh, and we would help prisoners think about the season beyond prison and and place them in jobs so that they could get a start again in in society and not return to the to the hood to the neighborhood that they had been out of because the the statistics are very poor for people who go back to the same neighborhood. Uh, again, a, a a mind-blowing uh, experience of, of a different group of people with life experience I had never had. And um, yeah, I have many more stories about that one, but I won't take our time on that now. So you finished up at Princeton in what year? 1985. 85. And how, what was the connection to Ireland? How did you, how did you get from Princeton to Ireland? I actually went the other direction. Uh, so I came out of college, and I had a job working in, uh, in, in London at a college. I wanted to do a year uh, overseas, uh, and to, hopefully to build up my law school resume, which was the intention at that time. And I um, got a job uh, in a, a church called uh, Great St. Helens Bishopsgate, uh, which is an a tremendous uh, Episcopal church, Anglican church, that was evangelical and had an enormous ministry with the business community. And I had become friends when I was in college with a man named Stephen Neal, who was the uh, mm -hmm. Anglican bishop to South in of South India, and he had been a visiting lecturer at Yale uh, my senior year. And we would we used to drink port and talk theology together. And he invited me to come and study with him at Oxford. So I was going to study on the weekends at Oxford, and I was going to work in this business person's ministry during the, during the daytime. And then I would come back and go to law school. But when I graduated from college, the job got pulled because of a scandal involving an American that was in the job that I was going to take. And they swore off American 20-somethings for a little while to let things settle there. And I was without a job. I was very, very disconcerted by that. And I decided that I would go over there and look for another job. And, and, and this was a valuable piece of, of 
advice I was given. A friend said to me, maybe the, maybe the job in London was just a breadcrumb. Hmm. Maybe God leads us with, by breadcrumbs sometimes. We want the whole road. <laughs> and uh, so I took that seriously, and I wound up going to, uh, to London and, and looking all over England for another role. And uh, I struck out, and I was ready to come back to the States, and I took one final appointment that was supplied by a, uh, my last contact at the Round Church in Cambridge. And he said, have you heard of this organization called Care Force? Uh, and I said, no. He says, it's a, it's a Christian Peace Corps. And uh, so I, I made an appointment to, to see the organizing secretary of this organization one rainy Tuesday morning in London. And I walked into his office. On a separate timeline, this is important to hear, hear this piece, on a separate timeline, a man is visiting a, a, a city. It's the days before cell phones. He's going to see a friend. He's gotten lost. He has to get out of his car, and he has to go find a payphone someplace. He goes into a pizzeria. The payphone's broken. He looks around, he sees a, an archway, and he goes into the archway, and he, he realizes it's in some kind of academic setting. And he goes into the first little entryway, and he knocks the doors of the rooms, and nobody's home. It's the middle of the day. All the students are at class. Goes to the second floor, repeats the exercise. Goes to the third floor, repeats the exercise. And finally, a student opens the door. He explains his condition, and the student says, come on in and use the phone. Now, back to the London timeline. I walked into the office of the organizing secretary, and our, our jaws dropped because he was the guy looking for the phone, and I was the kid that opened the door. It gets better. It gets better. Then we talk through uh, all of the opportunities that he has, and none of them are really the right match. I don't feel any sense of calling, and I say to him, uh, Philip, I think I need to go back to the States and just find something there. And the phone rings, and he says, I'm gonna, I want to walk you out, so let me just get rid of this call. And the call was from an Englishman pulling out of a job in Belfast, Northern Ireland. And because it, this was the height of the troubles there, the Bobby Sands, the hunger strikes, a lot of, a lot of armed, uh, a lot of bombing and all the rest of it. And... Um, and the man on the other end of the phone says, I think you need to find somebody who's not English. My parents won't let me go. And so Philip hung up the phone and he looked at me and he said, my boy, <laughs> the Lord may be at work here. Would you consider a position in Belfast, Northern Ireland? And I just felt this overwhelming sense that this was why I, I, I was sent here. Wow. And I went, ended up flying that afternoon to Belfast and accepted the job on the spot, and I spent two years there. Um, so it was just God's providence. I mean, you can't make it up. It's just one of these experiences I've had that defy all kind of empirical uh, analysis and just feels like there's a, there is a supernatural superintendent. There is a good shepherd, and, um, and I was grateful to be his sheep. <laughs> now, I know from, from your story that that time in Belfast was formative in some significant ways. Yeah. Tell us how God used those two years in your life. This was probably the first time I had been really Im immersed in the local church. I had attended uh, an Episcopal church in, uh, on and off during my college years, but I wasn't really part of the church's life. And I had come to faith late uh, in, in life, just before entering college. And now I was immersed in the life of a local church. Let me interrupt that. Yeah. Let's talk about that moment. Are you one of those people who can look at a point in time when something started in your life spiritually? Yeah, I can. I, I, it, was a, it was in August of 1997. Uh, I was a very, very lost, confused, struggling kid. Uh, I, my... My religion had, was you know, family, political influence, and material possessions. And my, I had a fresh-scrubbed kind of Kennedy-esque looking family. 
I had, my dad was a successful politician. My great uncle was a U.S. Senator. We, we, we were around a lot of, of political people and celebrities. My dad was also Jimmy Connors' lawyer, so we were around interesting people there. Um, and we lived in a nine-bedroom home on a 10-acre estate with you know, a lot of material comforts. And so I, this, for me, was what would give me security, significance. This is what mattered. And in the, in my, the fall of my senior year in high school, uh, my dad lost a race for U.S. Congress. Um, the next day, my mom asked him for a divorce. And, um, and, and within a year, she would marry his best friend. Now, my, I, don't, I love my father, but he was not uh, without culpability for some of this. So I'm not trying to say my mother was awful. She, <laughs> you, we, we all know it's complicated in life. Relationships are complicated. Uh, so I, um, I had lost a, my, my uh, paternal grandfather the year before, and I came to terms with the fact that it's sort of a family secret that my maternal grandfather uh, had, uh, who I very much looked up to, uh, had not been as happy as I thought, and he had actually taken his own life. So I... Uh, and then in the spring of the year, our house burned in a terrible fire. So in the space of a few months, everything that I believed in as a dependable source of security and significance went up in flames. And I was very, very shaken by it. I was, I was the, kid, the proverbial guy who built the house on the sand, and everything came crashing down. And I had been a recreational... Uh, substance user, like kids in affluent communities often are. If you get good grades and you're an athlete, you can get away with murder. I got away with a lot. And, uh, but now I became a chronic alcohol and drug abuser. And I just, I was just basically trying to go blotto. I, I was so angry, hurt, sad, lonely, confused. And I just wanted to self-anesthetize. And um, in the middle of that season, uh, summer of after I gra graduated, I, uh, my dad, who had come back to faith through his life falling apart, uh, said, I, I made a huge mistake. I failed to give you and your siblings the most important relationship of all. And I've lost your mother. Um, I'm sending you and, and your sister to a young life camp in August. And I said, like H-E double hockey sticks you are. <laughs> and I'm not spending the last couple of weeks of my freedom before college leaving my girlfriend and going with a bunch of religious fanatics. I'm not doing it. And he played paternal hardball like I'd never seen him do before. And he says, nope, you are going. And he, he held the keys to the kingdom of college, so I had no <laughs> choice. And... Uh, and I got on, I got on under a highway overpass in a white van and drove down to North Carolina to the Windy Gap facility of Young Life. And uh, that week, the Lord reached me through um, the witness of, of these very alive, very joyful, very loving uh, leaders uh, who, who, who listened to all of my anger and my doubts and skepticism and all of it. Um, and, uh, and then through the stories they told about this Jesus. And, uh, and I began to become very interested in Jesus as a literary character. Uh, I had no faith yet that he was the historical Jesus that uh, I, I now follow. But um, at that point, he was a very mesmerizing character in a book. And, and the stories they told about his um, remarkable uh, ability to, to stand up to the most powerful people of his day and yet be the kind of person that children throng to and fishermen felt at home with and, you know, I mean, all the things you understand, Bob. So I, I just, I became intrigued by him. So at the end of the week, I, I, I did not do the, the, I did not answer the altar call the way other people did. But I did pray, uh, if there is a God, if it's possible to have what I see in these people, 
if it is possible to know you like people say it's possible to know you. I would be open to learning more. Mm. And that got me on a journey. And now I was on a new road of trying to understand who Jesus was. And to make a, a long story a little shorter, I wound up in an InterVarsity Christian Fellowship group in college. I was mentored by a, a really a wonderful um, upperclassman. He fed me books that answered. He said, I would, I would throw out the, the skeptical assertion, and he says, are you really serious about testing that assumption? And, 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 I, and he said, at least if you're going to be an atheist, at least be an honest, honest one. At least do your homework. At least read. And, uh, and so I, I did a lot of reading, and I discovered just how credible the Christian faith was, how, uh, how many brilliant people had thought this stuff through and come to very deep personal convictions about these matters. And so there came a time when I no longer felt I was praying to the ceiling that, that I was interacting with, with a living Lord. God, with a living God. Thanks so, for taking yeah. that parentheses yeah. and telling your yeah. story, that part of your story. Yeah, thank you. Somewhere we were at the beginning of Northern Ireland. So I was in a local church, and I just fell in love with life of a local church and with the great hymns of the church. And with uh, I, I was mentored. I lived with a clergy couple, husband and wife team. He was an Oxford Honors graduate. He was just a brilliant man. He went on to become the head of the seminary. Uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, and I learned so much from him. And he was a ministry entrepreneur. And so he threw me in, into the deep end again and again and again. He made me preach out in like, these country parishes. He made me a chaplain at a psychogeriatric ward. He was, he was like my dad in that sense. He, he made, he, he, I, I ran a senior citizens club at 23. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was just an amazing uh, apprenticeship in the, all the different dimensions of ministry, and it was so good. So, and, I, and, I, and we had daily morning and evening prayer as a family, so I, I, still have, I still have memorized a lot of the language of the morning and evening prayer, and that was an incredible spiritual discipline. Uh, so that, that was uh, amazing. And um, I would say the other great value of that experience was um, I, I will never again look at issues in the inner city the same way hmm. uh, because I was suddenly in a, in a city with all Caucasian people and I, I was facing sort of some, I faced these racial, unacknowledged racial thoughts I'd had about, that explained why things were so difficult in our, in our cities. And I, and I saw all the same things in Belfast that, that I'd seen in New York. And I went, oh, the problem is nothing. At the core, it has nothing to do with race. It has everything to do with sustained economic opportunity and, and with the spiritual crisis. And when, when Northern Ireland finally, Belfast finally got sustained economic opportunity, for a wide breadth of people, it, it, it significantly improved conditions in, in Belfast. So, so that was an eye-opening experience for me. Um, you played semi-pro basketball. I did. On a Protestant Catholic yeah. team in Northern Ireland. Yeah. So it's very, very important, especially as you watch... March Madness right now, <laughs> not to confuse me with any of those players. <laughs> so I was, a, I was a decent high school varsity basketball player. Uh, I was on the rowing team in college. Uh, I, uh, I was missing sports when I was living in Ireland, so I, I went to a local uh, leisure center, they call them there, and I got in a pickup game. And uh, after the pickup game, a guy comes up to me and introduces himself. And he says, you're an American. I said, yeah, I am. And he says, um, I got a better game for you. 
and he was the head of the Northern Ireland Basketball Association. And uh, uh, they call it the Ulster Basketball Association. And, uh, and he threw me into a team called Star of the Sea, which eventually became Team Guinness. You can see the perks that went with that job. Uh, and in that league at that time, uh, two things were true. Uh, one is that you were allowed to have two paid Americans on your team. And the other was, the Americans didn't have to be very good. They just had to be better than the Northern Ireland guys. So, so I was not a great player. But, but it was a little bit like, you remember back in the 70s when Brazilians started playing soccer in the US? And, and the average Brazilian school kid looked like a superstar compared to an American kid. I was like that. So, but it was a great way to see uh, the whole island, because we traveled. We would play it in jam-packed amphitheaters, and we played in barns. And, uh, and we were a mixed team. We were both Catholic and Protestant. How'd that work out for you? That worked out great. That was a terrific thing. Uh, and we won the, the Northern Ireland Basketball Association. As we were a testimony to the power of, of that kind of integration, but um, yeah. Did that model something different? It was a great reminder. Yeah, it was just a great reminder that people are people at the core, and the, and the biggest problem we face is we do not know each other's stories. You know, I, I don't know if any of you have read David Brooks' new book, How to Know a Person, but I highly commend it. Brooks is a follower of Jesus. Um, uh, and he has written an incredible primer on what it means to build a relationship and get to know somebody else's story and what it is that makes them tick and how to share yours. And uh, so that, that I learned a lot about just the value of knowing other people's stories. Stories from that. So Northern Ireland became very formative in your sense of call. Yeah. How was that? At that point... When I went to Northern Ireland, I mentioned I, I, w I wanted to go to law school because I was wanting to, to have a career in public service. I wanted to follow the sort of the family business in a sense. And I had uh, studied, I was a poli-sci major. I had led the student government. I worked in lots of campaigns. Um, and uh, the, all of the things I loved about that, the organizing people towards a purpose, uh, meeting a breadth of, of people, uh, teaching and, and, and inspiring people, uh, all the things I liked about fixing problems. Uh, these, these were great things about public life. Uh, and I was surprised as I worked in the local church. These are the same things pastors do. They just are doing them uh, in, a, in a more contained context. And I began to increasingly feel this sense, this quickening sense that maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Hmm. You know, maybe this is... I had been in college, and I was, oil rig summer, I, I was dating a Chicago girl, and I visited Chicago and her family and went to the Fourth Presbyterian Church. Hmm. And Elam Davies, one of the great pulpit princes, yeah. you may remember him, uh, was in the, the Welshman. And as he was speaking, I thought, I had for the first time the thought, maybe I'm supposed to do what that man is going to do is doing. And at the lot, we were greeting at the back of church after the service, and my girlfriend uh, was with me, and, uh, and he, the pastor, said to my girlfriend, would you and your friend like to have lunch with, with Ruth and me? And Linda quickly apologized, no, because she knew I would have no interest in that. And before she could finish the apology, I said, yes, <laughs> we'd love to have lunch with you because I was dying to find out what pastors do between Sundays. I didn't think, what, what do these people do? <laughs> so uh, now I knew what pastors do when I was in Ireland. I knew what they did, and I kind of liked this rich life they had, and I began to feel a sense of calling to pastoral ministry. So you couldn't go to a good seminary, so you went to Princeton. <laughs> right. I hadn't yet discovered the, the, the other <laughs> he, seminary. He, he thinks the Northeast is about everything. <laughs> okay. New Yorker. <laughs> so you, you study at Princeton. How do you get, was Tom the pastor in Burlingame? Tom Gillespie was the new president of, of Princeton Seminary, and he'd come from First Presbyterian Church in Burlingame. California. And he, Tom took an interest in me, and, and he 
he said, I want you to go to, there's a, there's a job opening at the church I came from in California. I want to recommend you for that. And so I went and became the associate pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Burlingame. And I took the place of a gentleman by the name of Jeb Stuart Magruder. Do any of you know that name? <laughs> of Watergate? Same? So I took Jeb's spot. And I was, the pa- I was uh, associate pastor there for six years. And in, uh, uh, my, in 1988, I had a blind date. Uh, and... I had, I, because I was a young single pastor, a lot of the, of the ladies of the church felt sorry for me. I obviously couldn't <laughs> organize myself. And so they were introducing me to, to <laughs> their nieces and their daughters. And, and so I, I'd grown a little bit jaded. And uh, I, I had a friend with a, who was an uh, oral surgeon, and he uh, had an airplane. And we'd flown down to Mammoth for the day to go skiing and came back. And I, I didn't even bother to shower. I was cutting it close. I, it's another one of these blind dates, not going to go anywhere. So unshowered, I got into the back of the car with uh, the, the couple we were double dating with. And I looked across the bench seat, and I thought to myself, I should have showered. <laughs> <laughs> Because that young lady at the back of the room was across the bench seat. Like a sheep. <laughs> yes, I smelled like a sheep. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and that was on March 21st, by the way, just two days ago. It was our 36th dating anniversary. And, uh, and we were engaged on August 2nd and married New Year's Eve. So when you know, you know. So you, from there, you go to Rancho Santa Fe. When uh, do any of you know North County, San Diego, Rancho Santa Fe? If you do, okay. So, first time Dan calls, he said, "What is Ocean Reef like?" I said it's Rancho Santa Fe with a private airport and a yacht basin. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, this is your first time now being yeah. a lead pastor. Yeah. In, a, in another po- small, impoverished community. <laughs> what was that experience like? What's it like being a lead pastor for the first time? I think what I felt, and I'm sure all of us have our own correlative experiences of this in life, where, you, where you, you've stood on the outside watching a, somebody do a job and you've been, you've been critical of, of the way they're doing the job. And then you get in the job and you discover, well, that's a lot harder than I knew. <laughs> uh, often when we become parents, right, this is a moment like that where we go, gosh, mom and dad, they had a much tougher job. Uh, so it was a bit like that. I, I suddenly, it, this was a solo pastor church at the time, and, um, and so I really had to do everything. If the, you know, the furnace broke, I had to figure out, well, how are we going to get that fixed? But... Um, yeah, is that what it's like too, Jay? Here, too. Okay. So uh, I'll I'll just need a really good Rolodex because I'm that mechanical gifts are not the top for me. Actually, read. I'll call read in that, those moments. Uh, so it was just a great exposure to the full range of all that pastoral ministry involves, and and the incredibly eclectic nature of any given day in pastoral ministry. You know, you're going from uh, from the hospital to the wedding to the uh, to the budget meeting to the uh, you know the community gathering where you're uh, uh, supposed to be bring the prayer whatever it may be but just the immense diversity of the roles that you play and the the, the ways you have to shift to accommodate that uh, and I and I worked much because uh, Rancho Santa Fe is truly a community much like Ocean Reef and you're you're working with enormously thoughtful people. They're, almost everybody that lives there is, has run something, done something, invented something, um, and, and, and the surprising reality is, is, that, is, is how gracious people remain. Not always. We've got human beings everywhere, right? Um, but, but in general, I, just, I, I had such respect for the people of Rancho Santa Fe. And I learned a lot from them, and I was mentored by, by so many of them along the way. Uh, so I, I, and I learned that, that, that because you have reached a certain level of socioeconomic security does not mean that you are um, insulated 
from all of the agonies of life. And uh, yeah, why am I? I'm preaching to the choir. You, you get that. Um, and the, but that was important for me to really tune into. Uh, and, and, and I learned how to build a staff and build programs and buy lands and run capital campaigns and you know, all of the stuff that, that would then serve me very well when we went to Chicago. I can tell you that Rancho Santa Fe grieved when he left because one of my closest friends has been the pastor there now for more than 25 years. And uh, uh, following you, uh, Jack. Uh, Good man. So you go from Rancho Santa Fe to <clears throat> a, follow a legendary Chicago pastor, Art DeCryder. This is how I'm ready to, to one day come here, as I've already followed one legend. <laughs> Baloney. No, so, so you go to Chicago. Tell me about Christ Church when you got there 27 years ago. And so Christ Church was a, uh, had been planted in 1965 uh, in a burgeoning leadership community. And the western suburbs were expanding, and Oak Brook was founded by Paul Butler of Butler Aviation and Butler Paper as an executive community. And he decided, Butler decided, it's going to have a church. It's going to be a non-denominational church for the community. And he settled upon a young 38-year-old pastor in the, in, over in Western Springs who had a gift for talking with people who, had, who were well-educated, and well experienced in life. And uh, he asked him if he would be, he gathered up around him a number of people who said, would you come and start an independent non-denominational church in our community? So Art uh, did that, and Art and Gladys. And um, the church uh, was distinguished at that time by several things. It had, a, it had a terrific music program, solid youth ministry, really good preaching, uh, and it was not political. It, was, it, did, it did not get into the, uh, into the weeds on the right or the left. Uh, and it stuck with sort of a kingdom of God vision. What, is, what does Jesus say to us? And how does that transcend any, any one platform? How is the kingdom uh, its own platform? And, um, and so he stuck to the Bible when other people were preaching the New York Times. He, he, he stayed out of the morass of... Of the, of both ends of the spectrum, of on the political thing, um, and and yet he integrated um, theology and and history and philosophy and day to day life in ways that that really engaged people. So the church just because other churches weren't doing this, a lot of the business and professional leaders would visit other local churches and go, these these people can't even organize their bulletin board, you know. I mean it's 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 confusing, and they have all secondhand furniture. And uh, it, leaders weren't responding to churches like this. And Christ Church was founded with a vision of speaking in a way and doing life in a way that leaders would recognize as quality. And um, and the church grew dramatically during his tenure. By the time we arrived in in uh, 1990, summer of '96, as visitors, uh, it had gotten a lot older. And uh, it, it was it was the pastor was coming uh, close to uh, the end of his season. And uh, the f impression I had at the time as I sat in the back row was two, two impressions. Wow, lots of people here, too. In about 15 years, there won't be a single one of these people here. And, I, and that was a concern for me at the time. Uh, I said, I, what, what are we going to do about that? So... The, the analogy I used to use with, with our elders was, I, hear, I live with the sound of a waterfall in my ear, and it's the demographic waterfall. And we have to start building wings on the raft right now so that when we reach the waterfall, we're already airborne. Mm. So my work over the last uh, couple of decades has been equipping, the, putting the wings on. And so today, it's a dramatically different church. So it still values all of the, that amazing um, generation. I'm in that generation now. I would have, I'm the white-haired guy. Um, but um, ultimately, um, it is blessings to you. Thank you for coming. Pardon me for interrupting. I have a question with the grandchildren. You're not 
I don't, I don't miss that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I should stand. For those of you who don't know the back story, <laughs> Paul was at a rod and gun club dinner a few years ago, and I'm sitting in the back, and he's the guy up front. And he says, the reverend is in the back, but I have been invited to give the invocation because I am a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So what does... Uh, the church today, you've got 145 people working. You have hundreds of volunteers. You have 3,000 people attending every weekend. You've got satellite congregations. Um, you used a metaphor in sharing with your congregation. You compared that church to O'Hare, okay? And you said, I'm ready for a smaller airport. Yeah. What does that mean? I did not go into pastoral ministry because I wanted to run a large organization. Uh, I, I have skills for running a large organization, it turned out. Um, but I, I, I fell in love. At the, you know, let me take you back to Belfast. I fell in love with being a pastor to people walking with them in the pain points and the celebration moments and um, casting a vision and being blessed by the vision of God's Word. And so as I came to the end of you know, what, that major curve of my life, I, just, I, I was excited about the idea of going back to the basics again, the things that I originally, my first love. Uh, and so this is part of why... Um, you know, that, that phone call with you, Bob, um, it felt so stimulating and uh, inspiring. It, almost an, it, was an, it was an answer to prayer. We were trying to figure out what is next uh, for us. And, um, and I've, I've, I remember talking with Bill Nunn at dinner, and I, and I know he expressed some concern. That, you know, do you understand that this is about core pastoral ministry? You know, it's not, you've had a staff doing all these things. You understand? And I didn't know how to explain to him. You know, I, I am a pastor at heart. I'm not like one of these green room guys who speaks to the big crowd and then hides in the back. In the back. You know, I'm, I love the people of the church. And so I'm, ex, I'm really motivated by the thought of getting to know the members of this community. Uh, and, I, and I mean not just the chapel community, but of the whole community. And... Um, I think the Lord has wired me in such a way that I make, I build relationships fairly well with a really wide range of people. You know, if you can work with the guys on the oil rig and, <laughs> and the prison, you know. And, if you got you ready for Ocean Reef. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just, you get to know people. People are people are people, right? We have different life experiences, but at the core we have the same hungers. Well, I've. Uh, that sounds just like the, uh, the book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Yeah, John Mark Comer. It's a, yeah, I, he, yeah he's, he's put things well there. I think a lot of us can relate to how he sees our challenge and opportunity. Well, I, I like the way Chip interrupted me. Was exact, <laughs> no, that was exactly where we were going. Uh, I've left you about five minutes for you to be able. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed getting to know Dan and his heart. So, Nelson, yeah. He, this is the guy who'll fix the air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's important that he knows about what he does here. This school secures the rich and the poor. The city can't keep him busy. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Anybody? Yeah, Janie. Do you like sports? What do you like to do in your spare time? Maybe like so I've had so little spare time through the years. Uh, that's my fault. That's nobody else's but mine. Um, I, Amy and I uh, are trying to learn how to play golf better. Uh, so we've been, but we enjoy being out on the golf course. Uh, I grew up uh, as a young man playing quite a bit of tennis, although I haven't played 
decades with any kind of regularity, except at fa family vacation tennis. Uh, I, I will look forward to learning pickleball because it's taken my wider family by storm, and I, I'd like to learn it. Uh, I will never play at the Chuck Hart's level, but uh, <laughs> but I uh, I would like to. I've got long arms, <laughs> so um, so I would, would enjoy doing that. Amy loves fly fishing, and uh, my girl, and uh, <laughs> and that's very very attractive. Both of us have done uh, shotgun and pistol shooting as well, um, and a little little bit of bird hunting uh, up in the Midwest. Uh, so there, we know that this is a place of, of so many wonderful activities and communities of fellowship that gather around them. So we, we look forward to joining in and learning. And uh, I, play, I don't play a lot of basketball anymore. But yeah, snow skiing, I love to snow ski. I, don't, I didn't see a slope anywhere near here. Uh, but we've enjoyed that in the past. Got time for one more, maybe? Yes, Lori. What do you expect from us, from not just the congregation, but the community? You know, I don't know that expect is, it, I don't come in with a sense of demand about anything. Uh, I come in as a learner, as a uh, feeling grateful. Um, but I, I, do, I, do, I do hope for uh, friendship. Uh, I do hope for an opportunity to um, to get to know people at a at a deeper level. I hope I hope um, people are funny about about pastors. You know, they they don't know what to make of a pastor sometimes. <laughs> and um, I, I would meet a girl sometimes when I was out at a night spot, and as soon as she'd hear that I was a pastor in training, she heard her mother calling, and she needed to leave. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so I, I, I hope I hope folks will give us a chance and get to know us, um, and because we're very eager to know them, um, we're also aware that there's there's a ton of things we don't have a clue about yet about the nature of we, we we don't just because we have lived in other beautiful resourced communities, there are nuances and characteristics to this place that it's all its own, and so we have to pay a lot of attention. Do you think we should expect something? Is there anything that kicks up for you? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I just think friendship is the most meaningful thing to us. I, I, I do think, I, I feel sometimes some concern that, and my wife would, would echo this, um, I have spent the last 40, 30, 40 years building stuff. And so I, I am... I don't want to try and do that all over again. I, I don't want to come in and try and be an institution builder. I do want to breathe. I do want to have space for reflection. I want to, I want to read. I want to be thoughtful in my leadership. And these children will eventually produce grandchildren. We pray. <laughs> and, uh, the, uh, and I want some space for that. I want, uh, I, I want to work. I want to be involved in meaningful pastoral ministry. And I also want to have some life beyond that. Uh, I, I think it would be okay for me to have an identity that's rooted as much in being a husband and a dad and a grandfather as it is being a public figure. And uh, so making that shift, I would value your, your asking me from time to time, how's that going? Why are we seeing you out at night every night? Um, <laughs> You know, how, is the ba how are your boundaries? You know, so the problem will not be, nobody will have to worry, that, is Dan act outgoing enough? <laughs> no one will have to worry about that any more than you'd have with our brother. Uh, but I, I, will, I will be very sad if I entered into this season of life and didn't love my wife extremely well and spend time doing fun things together and, and my kids. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Now do you see why I am so grateful um, and, and so uh, hopeful uh, 
uh, about this next stage uh, in ministry here. Uh, as I said this morning, Jane and I both know it's time for us, and we look forward to these months of transition that we're both going to be living through. Um, and But um, the gift of this relationship with a man whom I've known about for 30 years has been one of the great joys of this. I'm gonna, Chuck, I'm going to ask you to do something. Come on up here. I want you to stand right here. Okay. No, you're not done. <laughs> I want you to stand right here because this is the spot where everybody can hear you. Right there, over that. And I want to invite all of you to extend your hands forward in blessing. Amy, come on up here, would you? Stand with, be with this guy. Stand up. And uh, I'm going to ask Chuck to lead us in a prayer. Uh, extend your hand forward in blessing, would you, Chuck? Uh, Lord God, you are God. You are God alone. We, uh, we are just are so happy and fortunate to feel that you've led us in the right path. We just thank you for uh, giving us your faith and the opportunity to hear your word and to follow your direction and be comforted by the Holy Spirit as we went through this process. Yeah. We ask that you continue to uh, bless this family, uh, to watch over them while they go back to Christ Church and make um, an exit, which is, um, you know, leaving well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, we comfort uh, Jane and Bob as they go through this process mm -hmm. because um, they mean so much to us. We, so have, we owe them so much. We thank you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.